Good morning, and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. This is the Fast Friday edition of the show for September 24th, 2021. And on this episode, I'm continuing a series covering the papers of one of the most prominent anti-federalist writers, Brutus. Today, I've got highlights of his ninth essay, where he continues his argument from the previous one, his warnings on the danger of standing armies. Here, he directly responds to some claims made by Alexander Hamilton in Federalist Number 24 and also Noah Webster. Both of them basically took the position that, well, people who are opposed to powers under the Constitution regarding standing armies, uh, there's actually nothing to worry about, nothing to see here. Move along, people. Everything's fine. And Brutus absolutely hammers on both of them. I think you'll find it pretty interesting. But first of all, before getting to that, my name is Michael Bolden. We broadcast live every Monday, Wednesday and Friday at 930 a.m. Pacific time from here in my home office and studio in downtown Los Angeles for the 10th Amendment Center. Our show homepage is everything you need to follow this show, all the archives on individual episodes. I include a bunch of stuff that I links to stuff that I talk about so you can read and learn more in context on your own time. You can find all the different platforms that we're on. Of course, we're on all the live stream video platforms. We archive on a bunch of other video platforms. We have the audio only podcast edition and also our membership program where you can put your financial faith behind our work for as little as two bucks a month. And we make it go a long, long way in support of the Constitution and Liberty. And of course, if you like this Brutus information, just scroll down to the bottom of the home of the show homepage and you're going to find all of those included in its own section. That is 10th Amendment Center dot com slash path to liberty. And I couldn't be more grateful for you spending some of your time with me today. Thank you so much for being here, whether this is your first episode or you've been here for every single one since day one. I can't thank you enough. But since it's Fast Friday, I promise to not take up too much of your time. Let's see if I can get this info out to you in the next 10 to 15 minutes ish. And I want to start out setting the stage. Uh, citing an article from one of my favorite publications, Journal of the American Revolution at allthingsliberty.com. This is from Griffin Beauvais, I think it is. <laughs> I probably got that wrong. But this is an article published a few years ago. And he puts it this way. In his ninth letter, Brutus presumed that it would be useless, and this is in Brutus's word, it would be useless to enter into a labored argument to prove to the people of America, that's Brutus's phrase, that standing armies are detrimental to a people's liberty. This is, according to Brutus, a position which has so long and so generally been received by them as a kind of axiom. So it was widely accepted by the people of the time that standing armies would lead to a destruction of liberty. Of course, there were some that weren't on board with that long standing view, long held view. Otherwise, this argument wouldn't have been happening at all. And Griffin's article goes into some of the history of that that I think is very interesting. This section, English Origins of Anti-Standing Army Sentiment. He puts it this way. To better understand the intellectual inheritance of revolutionary America's antipathy for standing armies, it's important to examine the gradual emergence of English distrust towards soldiers and government military policies in the early 17th century. It's also an outgrowth from the late previous century, things like the uh, Spanish Armada and uh, stuff that happened after that. But he goes further. He says, even before England entered into the expansive military conflicts of the 1600s, there was a common belief that the country, by, it, by nature of its island status and past experiences, did not require a pet professional army. Now, I'm not going to get into the details of everything that happened after that, but Griffin gives a really good overview of some of the things that went down in 17th century England. I encourage you to read the article. It's pretty long, but it's really interesting stuff. Now, he goes a little further. He says, these same concerns that dominated country party thought in the late 17th and early 18th centuries became prevalent in America after 1763. And that year is very important in regards to this, because no matter how much we learn about things from books or podcasts or live streams, whatever, when it's something about the power of government, we really, really take it to heart when we live through it and we experience it personally. And after 1763 is an important time. And Griffin puts it this way. At the conclusion of the French and Indian War, the British government, determined to protect its newly earned land holdings, decided to maintain a force of around 10,000 troops in the colonies. 
on this fact alone, colonists became worried. And of course, we know that over the next few years, and especially around seven years later, the massacre in Boston in 1770, that really hammered home that these standing armies were a thing to be opposed and even hated. And here's how Griffin put it. He said, so universally contemptible was the British standing army in the colonies that a grievance against unauthorized standing armies was included in the Declaration of Independence. Now, in the eighth paper, which I, I've got a link to the episode pulled up here. Of course, I will include that in the show notes. Brutus looked at the combined powers to uh, to borrow money, so debts, to lay and collect taxes, and to raise and support armies as a trifecta that would absolutely destroy liberty. This is something that was echoed by James Madison some years later when he warned that armies and debts and taxes in conjunction are the known instruments for putting the many under the domination of the few. And here from the founder, founder of the day, they write, Brutus starts off essay number nine by admitting the framers of the Constitution did some things right. He wasn't just opposing everything just to be, I don't know, contrarian. Specifically, they write, he notes that they put limits on certain aspects of the federal government, specifically no bills of attainder. He then goes on to question why similar limits were not put on standing armies. He acknowledged that when they included or didn't include something, they thought about it. They often debated it. And there were reasons why things weren't included. So he was wondering, well, why aren't the same? There's that two year thing, but it wasn't restricted, like no standing armies in times of peace, for example. Here's how he put it. A writer in favor of this system treats this objection as a ridiculous one. And here's where he starts ripping into Noah Webster. He quotes Webster as well. Webster thinks it's absurd to be worried about uh, standing armies under the proposed Constitution. And here's how there's some mudslinging here, uh, I guess, 18th century style. Here's how Brutus put it from the positive and dogmatic manner in which this author, that's Webster, delivers his opinions and answers objections made to his sentiments, one would conclude that he was some pedantic pedagogue who had been accustomed to deliver his dogmas to pupils who had always placed implicit faith in what he delivered. He's just slamming on him as being arrogant and, well, just the way he approached it. Going further, he says, but why is this provision so ridiculous? Because, says Webster, he says, says the author, it's unnecessary. And why is a restriction on standing armies unnecessary? He says, quote, because the principles and habits, as well as the power of the Americans, are directly opposed to standing armies. And there is as little necessity to guard against them by positive constitutions as to prohibit the establishment of the Mahometan religion. So uh, Islam, I believe that is. So he's basically Webster's taking the position that, well, the people of the country are not in favor of large permanent standing armies. So why should we include a prohibition? Pointless. They're not in favor of this particular religion. So why would we include a, a, a provision against it if we wanted to restrict that? Maybe Webster would have wanted to restrict religion as well as having large permanent standing armies. Brutus goes further. He says, this reasoning supposes that the general government is to be exercised by the people of America themselves. We hear this all the time today. You wouldn't think that at the time of the founding, people were looking at a uh, representative government that was going to be small as actually representing the people. But Brutus in some papers earlier had specifically talked about how under this system, real representation is impossible. Going further, he says, this idea that government would be exercised by the people rather than rulers is groundless and absurd. He says there surely is a distinction between the people and their rulers, even when the latter are representatives of the former. They certainly are not identically the same, and it cannot be disputed, but it may and often does happen that they do not possess the same sentiments or pursue the same interests. And if you really think about it, even if there was one representative for 10 people, if the 10 people each had different views, then 90 percent of the people were not being represented. So that's all. I mean, it's a whole different discussion, but it's important to bring this up 
Because if Noah Webster is taking the position that, well, if the representatives of the people create the standing army and then that's just what the people wanted and everything's cool. He's like, this is nonsense because that's not how it works. He goes further. He says, besides, if the habits and sentiments of the people of America are to be relied upon as the sole security against the encroachment of their rulers, all restrictions and constitutions are unnecessary. Like if the people have this view today that they don't like such and such, so therefore we never have to worry about government doing the wrong thing, then why even have a constitution at all? Now, Webster's basically being a short term thinker. Maybe he was right for a couple of years and that, you know, the people at that time would be against it. But like Brutus makes a really good point. What's the point of having a constitution at all if you're just claiming that the people right now are against that type of power, so they're not going to use it anyways? Going a little further, this is from Jeffrey Campbell who I cited in uh, the episode on paper number eight in a 2009 paper for Oklahoma State University. He says Brutus accused Federalists of wanting standing armies to suppress dissent. He claimed, quote, it is a well-known fact, this is how Brutus put it, that a number of those who had an agency in producing this system are avowedly in favor of standing armies. He probably had some inside scoop that some people were on top of this type of thing. They were okay with it. And one of the people he was alluding to primarily was Alexander Hamilton. He's responding specifically to Hamilton's views in Federalist Number 24. Jeffrey uh, says, playing on the fears that Hamilton was a monarchist secretly plotting to circumvent American liberties, Brutus warned that Hamilton would not need much of an excuse to create a standing army. And I wonder how people were thinking, even though it wasn't uh, a federal standing army that went down in 1793, I wonder how many people were looking back at these warnings that Hamilton himself would want this type of thing. Uh, and just an interesting thought experiment. experiment. Going further, we did have a lot of kind of back and forth mudslinging. We saw how uh, Brutus was hammering on Webster. Hamilton was saying almost the same type of thing. People who are opposed to this, they're basically lying to you. They're tricking you. They aren't really opposed. They're not concerned about this. There's something else underneath it. And Brutus responds to that. He says he sets out with calling in question. He's referring to Hamilton, calling in question the candor and integrity of those who advance the objection and with insinuating that it is their intention to mislead the people by alarming their passions rather than to convince them by arguments addressed to their understandings. Back to founder of the day, they say Brutus responds that the Federalists are the ones actually preying on the people's fears by telling them that they are defenseless against any attack without the protection of a standing army. Of course, this resonated with a lot of people because there was that history. There's the massacre in 1770, the 10,000 troops in 1763, and the history going back to the, to the 17th century and even earlier, a long-standing tradition of this political thought that standing armies were dangerous. Back to Brutus, who actually closed out this paper by specifically correcting Hamilton. Hamilton was taking the position that opponents of the power under the Constitution regarding standing armies were concerned. He, you know, he's taking the position that this is nonsense because, well, according to Hamilton, Almost the same power existed under the Articles of Confederation, and because we haven't had this type of problem under that, why are all of a sudden they concerned about it under this new proposal? There's obviously something else, according to Hamilton. But Brutus says, you know, this is nonsense. You can't compare the power under these two uh, forms of government or these two documents as being close at all. And here's how he put it. Under the present Confederation, the representatives of nine states out of 13 must assent to the raising of troops or they cannot be levied under the proposed constitution, a less number than the representatives of two states in the house of representatives and the representatives of three states and a half in the Senate with the assent of the president may raise any number of troops. They please. So basically he's saying it's a much higher hurdle to be able to raise troops under the Articles of Confederation, this is far different. He says the Congress also under the present form are amenable to and removal 
by the legislatures of the respective states. So he's pointing out that, oh, well, if they still try to do this anyways, the states may recall them and they are chosen for one year only. The proposed constitution does not make the members of the legislature accountable to or removal removable by the state legislatures at all. And to sum it up, I think this really does it quite well. At the end, he says the public will judge from the above comparison how just a claim this white writer has to that candor he affects to possess. In the meantime, to convince him and the advocates for the system that I possess some share of candor, I pledge myself to give up all opposition to it on the head of standing armies, opposition to it on these grounds, he says, if the power to raise them be restricted as it is in the present confederation. And I believe I may safely answer not only for myself, but for all who make the objection that they will be satisfied with less. So Hamilton's taking the position in Federalist 24 that, oh, well, you've already got this power under the articles. Don't worry about it under the Constitution. Brutus points out that's a lie. And I think this is very Hamiltonian as well. Hamilton was very good at providing a message that would resonate with the people listening to it and then happy over the years to say, something completely different. And Brutus really called him out on that here in his ninth paper. He continues his arguments against standing armies in the next one, which I'm going to cover in the near future. Well, I hope you guys found this interesting. I hope it was educational. Of course, I'm going to link to all this stuff in the show notes over at 10th Amendment Center com slash path to liberty. If you want to help me spread the word and get this show out to more people, please consider leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, smashing the like button, leaving comments on places like YouTube, Facebook and all the other mainstream platforms, because doing that stuff triggers their algorithm and tells the platform to show the program to more people. And as I mentioned at the outset, you can also put your financial faith behind our work. It starts out as little as two bucks a month over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. Please don't feel any obligation to pitch in, but if you're able to, I'd be very, very grateful for your support. Again, I hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope you have a great weekend ahead, and I'll see you next week here on The Path to Liberty.